If you go ahead and grab a sheet of paper, a compass and a straight edge, which is just an idealized ruler without markings, you can easily construct some regular polygons from just two points. Before I tell you which of the regular polygons are constructible, think about it yourself. Can you construct a triangle? A square? A pentagon? And if so, why exactly can you construct these? Also, which regular polygons are not constructible? Can you find the pattern? So you probably already knew that you can construct a triangle, that is, a 120 degree angle. And of course you can also create 90 degree angles and therefore a square. Constructing the 60 degree angle of a hexagon is probably the easiest of them all. And as soon as you have one vertex, you can easily get all remaining ones, because all of them lie on the same circle and the edges between them all have the same distance. So it's just a matter of translating this distance with your compass. A five-sided regular polygon, a pentagon, is a bit more difficult, but still very much achievable. And why this exact construction works is something you're going to understand after watching this video. Note that when constructing the pentagon, you first construct the cosine of the 72 degree angle of the pentagon and then the vertex itself via a perpendicular line. Moving on, doubling the vertices of a regular polygon is as easy as splitting its edges in half. And combinations of different polygons like the 15-sided one, the pentadecagon, which is composed of triangles and pentagons, are constructible as well. But there are also several non-constructible regular polygons. The first one is the heptagon, the regular polygon with seven sides. Nonogon, with nine sides, is not constructible as well, which is because you can't split an angle into three. Other non-constructible polygons are the 11, 13, 14, 17... Wait, actually, the 17-sided polygon is constructible, and here's how. Okay, can you see the pattern now? Frankly, it seems a bit random, initially. To explain all of this, let's start at the very beginning. With a sheet of paper, your two tools and two points. One is labeled O for origin, and the other one is called E or 1, 0. Now, go ahead and pick two random points. One will be named A, and the other one will be named B. You can now actually do calculations with these points using only the compass and straight edge. I encourage you to try all these calculations yourself before I show you the solution. Adding two points works by drawing a parallelogram from the origin to both points, with the remaining vertex being the sum. Constructing this point using compass and straight edge is not too hard. Finding the additive inverse of a point is nothing more than mirroring it at the origin, since adding a and negative a together then gives us precisely the origin. Multiplying two points together is something I have to explain a bit more. Essentially, you take the angles between e, o and each point and add them together. As for the distance between the origin and the product, the so-called argument, it's the product of the arguments of the two points. 
And if you've heard about complex numbers, you have probably already noticed that we are essentially just calculating with complex numbers here. So the multiplicative inverse of A should be mirrored along the line through O and E, which we will call the real axis from now on, and have a length of 1 over the length of A. So how do you construct this using compass and straight edge? Try it yourself. As for the angles, it's not too hard, just add them on the unit circle or mirror the angle respectively. Multiplying two lengths A and B is done using the intercept theorem. First you construct a right triangle with sides 1 and A, so its side lengths have a ratio of A to 1. Constructing a bigger triangle with the same ratio but one side length of B, for the ratio to be still A to 1, the other side must have a length of A times B. Similarly, for 1 over A, we construct two triangles with the ratio of 1 to A. The smaller one will have sides with length 1 and 1 over A. In total, this means that the constructible numbers from two points O and E form a thing called field, which we call C from now on. You can add and multiply them. You have neutral elements for both operations, and for every element there's an inverse one for both operations. Except for the origin there's no multiplicative inverse. The neutral element of addition is often called zero, while the neutral element of multiplication is then called one. So we'll call the point O, 0 and E, 1 from now on. For now, this field is isomorphic to the rational complex numbers. But we can extend it one step further. The square root of a point A has half the angle and the square root of the argument, so that multiplying the square root of A with itself is A. Cutting an angle in half is no problem. And constructing the square root of the length A is done using the right triangle altitude theorem. Append a line of length 1 to A and draw a circle with the new line as a diameter. A line perpendicular to this diameter at the point A intersects the circle after distance of square root of A. And these are all operations we can do. Add, subtract, multiply, divide and the square root. So our field has this structure. And you can write every point as a complex number. With the real part parallel to the real axis and an imaginary part perpendicular to it. Therefore. The complex numbers you can construct are those for which the real part and the imaginary part can be written using only addition, subtraction, multiplication, division and the square root. In turn, an angle is constructible if and only if its cosine, which is the real part on the unit circle, is constructible. Turns out that the cosine of 2 pi over 17 is indeed constructible, while the cosine of 2 pi over 7 is not. And some famous problems are now easy to solve. Squaring a circle is impossible because one would have to construct the square root of pi to get a square root on every pi. But pi is not constructible because it's transcendental and therefore cannot be expressed using our five operations. And to double a cube with a side length of a and therefore a volume of a cubed, one would have to construct the length of the cube root of 2a cubed, so cube root of 2 times a. You cannot construct cube roots, therefore it's impossible. But how do you know that the cosine of 2 pi over 17 is constructible? To show that, we will construct a 17-sided regular polygon around the origin, with the zero vertex being 1. Now the 17 vertices lie evenly spaced on the unit circle. Note that every vertex has a so-called conjugate, which is the vertex mirrored at the real axis. Adding a number to its conjugate yields twice the real part. Now because all vertices have an argument of 1, multiplication is just addition of the angles. Let's label the vertices with zeta 0 to zeta 16. This notation makes sense because zeta 1 can be multiplied with itself 1 to 16 times to get zeta 2 to zeta 16. Also, zeta 0 is 1. Note that zeta 17 would be zeta 0 again, likewise zeta 18 would be zeta 1, zeta 35 would be zeta 2 and so on. When we now raise every zeta to a power, for example 3, that is, multiply all angles by 3, we get back all zetas. Starting at zeta 1 and repeatedly raising it to 3, we'll hit every zeta from zeta 1 to zeta 16 exactly once before returning to zeta 1. Note that this must not always work at all. Raising it to 2 instead will result in a shorter cycle.
and for bases which are not prime, it actually never works. Take 6 for example. So based on that order of zeta1 to zeta16, we can actually find them all. Note that in this order, the conjugate of each number lies exactly 8 steps after the number itself. Now, first, we know that the center of mass of the entire polygon is at the origin. So the sum of all zetas is 0. And because we know that zeta0 is 1, the sum of zeta1 to zeta16 is negative 1. The product is again a matter of adding the exponents, so it's zeta to the 136, which is just zeta0, which is 1. Next step, we split the zetas in half. The numbers e to 0 and e to 1 each get every second zeta from the reordered list, again, for every number also containing its conjugate. So we end up with these sums for e to 0 and e to 1. Adding e to 0 and e to 1 gives just the full sum, so negative 1. Multiplying both is a bit tedious, but you can convince yourself that each power shows up exactly 4 times. You can get both eta0 and eta1 from knowing their sum and product. Using Lyatis formulas, we get a quadratic equation. Solving this quadratic equation geometrically is possible using the compass and straight edge. Think about it. How can you solve a general quadratic equation of the form x squared minus px plus q using only these tools? The answer is the so-called Carlyle circle. First, you construct the point PQ. Keep in mind that P has a negative sign in the equation. Then draw a line between PQ and 0, 1. Get the midpoint and draw a circle through both points. If your equation has real solutions, the circle will intersect the real axis there. In this case, precisely at eta0 and eta1. The greater solution is eta0 in this case. Also, eta0 and eta1 are both on the real axis, because for every number, its conjugate is in the same block as well, so the imaginary part is cancelled out. Next, we split the etas into mu0, mu1, mu2 and mu3. They are defined similarly to the etas, that we take every fourth element of the zetas. The sum of mu0 and mu2 is therefore eta0, and the sum of mu1 and mu3 is eta1. The product of mu0 and mu2, or mu1 and mu3 respectively, is again a bit more tedious to calculate, but it's the sum of all zetas, so negative 1 in both cases. Now we can create two quadratic equations again, and solve them using the Carlyle circle. This time we actually only need mu0 and mu1, as you're going to see soon. One more split and we get beta 0 to beta 7 from mu 0 to mu 4. And this time we take every 8th zeta, so every zeta with its conjugate. So beta 0 is zeta 1 plus zeta 16, because they are conjugates, this is just twice the real part. And therefore beta 0 is actually just 2 times the cosine of our angle, 2 pi over 17. Actually calculating beta 0 is just like the previous numbers. Beta 0 plus beta 4 is mu 0 per definition, and their product evaluates to mu 1. This gives us the following quadratic equation, which you can again solve with the Carlyle circle. And finally, we have our cosine. In case you wonder, the pentagon from earlier was constructed using the exact same method. Try to find the equations yourself and solve them using color circles. Of course you can solve these equations algebraically as well using the PQ formula. And get the algebraic expression for the cosine with that. 
So what regular polygons with n vertices can you construct using this method? Try to figure it out yourself. n must be primed to find an adequate order for the zetas. And second, the number of the zetas, which is one less than n, must be reducible to two by splitting them in half. Because only that way, we can write it as a quadratic equation and therefore solve it every time. In other words, n must be one larger than the power of two. For example, if n is 7, you have zeta 1 to zeta 6. To get every zeta together with its conjugate, you have to split them into 3. This gives a cubic equation, which is not solvable with compass and straight edge in general. So n must be a prime number of the form 2 to the 2 to the m plus 1. These numbers are called Fermat primes. The only Fermat primes known so far are those where m is from 0 to 4. There is no two-sided polygon, so we can construct regular polygons with 3, 5, 17, 257 and 65,537 sides. Finally, as we have seen earlier, we can combine distinct Fermat primes to create, for example, a 15-sided regular polygon. And we can always double the vertices. This gives us the general expression for constructible regular polygons, with k and t being non-negative integers and p1 to pt distinct Fermat primes. Let's end it with a question for you. If you had an additional tool for angle trisection, which regular polygons could you construct? Anyways, thank you so much for watching. I'd really appreciate it if you could like and subscribe and leave your feedback in the comments. And now you should watch this video.